I think this one is cute. Here's a magnetic teething necklace for babies. They put this magnetic teething necklace around their neck and supposedly it was supposed to draw out the teething pains. And we know this isn't a humbug because they let you know. It says this is not a humbug. This item that I've brought here is a horn for an old car. And this is somewhere between 1905 and 1910. And it's unique because it has four trumpets and it plays a tune. Would you like to hear the tune? So I regard it as a kind of a compliment when one of the newspapers called me a junk man of history. They say, well, when are you going to stop? You've got six warehouses full. You can't, well, I'll just build another warehouse. When the four-year-old goes running around yelling, Henry, Henry Aldridge, then I know I've made an inroad. When somebody spends thousands of dollars to travel across the Atlantic to buy an item worth 10 cents or a dollar in order to fill in his collection, then one appreciates that there is an illogic involved. Yes, why do people collect? Who knows? Brought to you by American National Bank and Trust Company of Chicago, where people make the difference in banking. Here to introduce tonight's program is Ira Frank, Jr., Administrative Vice President. All of us at American National Bank are proud to be a living part of this dynamic city of Chicago. And we're especially pleased to be able to bring you these important special programs each Tuesday evening. Programs about some of the interesting people and unusual happenings in and about our area. As much as we'd like to, we don't have time to keep up with all that's going on. So over the years, these WMAQ specials have helped many of us become better acquainted with some of interesting activities. Tonight's program is about some people like you and me. People who have found real pleasure in collecting unusual memorabilia. All of us at the bank hope that you will have as much enjoyment watching as they have had with their hobbies. Right now, somewhere in the United States, people are collecting locks, keys, autographs, cupid dolls, cuspidors, stagecoaches, woodpecker holes, watch fobs, sandwich glass, hat pins, expired press passes, and butterflies. There are clubs and magazines for collectors of stamps, coins, barbed wire, bottles, campaign buttons, miniature cars, cigar bands, postcards, sugar packets, mechanical banks, carnival glass, and streetcar transfers. Who collects? What? Why? Well, Chuck Shaden edits a group of community newspapers during working hours. The rest of the time, he devotes to his collection of old radio tapes. Well, I've got about 6,000 different radio programs from the last 40 years or so, which translates itself into a 500 or 600 reels of tape jamming them in as tightly as we can to, uh, to save space, because space becomes a problem. The uh, Fibber McGee and Molly programs, the Lux Radio Theater, Suspense, Lights Out, The Shadow, Inner Sanctum, all of the actual programs. If it isn't up to see, the original half man, half nose well. <laughs> well, Charlie McCarthy, the woodpecker's pinup boy. <laughs> Well, as long as you're here, Bill, you can talk to me while Charlie's getting his hair cut. Ah, uh, you know, Edgar, it's touching to see your affection for the little nipper. It strikes a tender chord in my heart. Oh, thank you, Bill. You know, I thought you didn't like children. Oh, not at all, Edgar. I love children. <laughs> I can remember when, with my own little unsteady legs, I toddled from room to room. <laughs> When was that? Last night? Or... Gosh, Portland, it's good to be back in Allen's Alley. Well, let's see what Titus Moody is up to tonight. Howdy, Bob. Say, <laughs> Say Mr. 
Mr. Moody, you you look shorter tonight. First time I ever wore a union suit and stockings. Well, what uh, what makes you look shorter? It's trying to keep up my stockings. Your stockings? Yeah. Uh, this little door hangs down on the back of the union suit. And uh, when I button that door on my stockings, yes, it pulls me down six inches. <laughs> Dave Langerman is sales manager for a wholesale drug firm. Years on the road selling to druggists brought him in contact with a treasure of old patent medicine bottles. My grandfather and father both had drug stores. And so I have a natural interest in patent medicines and pharmaceuticals and so forth. Well, I was in a store and uh, looked in the drawer for some merchandise, and I happened to come upon this Brown's throat trochees. And I asked him if I could have it. He, he said because he was going to throw it away anyway. So I looked inside. And in the testimonial and the wraparound on the package, it said that when you come back from a day's driving and your throat is dusty from the drive, that you should take one of these. And then all of a sudden it hit me how old this was, because if his throat was dusty, it must have been on a, a wagon. So uh, this got me started, and I figured, gee, there must be a lot of other items around. Some of them have very funny names, like Sev of Bye Bye, and uh, Mother's Gray, Mother Gray's Sweet Powders. And uh, here's a famous one a lot of people have heard about, Dr. Williams' Pink Pills for Pale People. <laughs> Did you ever try taking joke. this? No, I'm not that pale. <laughs> and uh, here's a very funny one, Rub My Tism, Rheumatism and Man and Beast. It's a biggie. Joe Jacobs is a highly respected labor lawyer. He considers Franklin D. Roosevelt a pivotal character in American history. I have approximately some, say, 30 or 35 uh, different categories of items uh, which compose a, a presidential collection such as that on, uh, on FDR. However, what we have here are all of the representational pieces, some of which, of course, have, uh, have great interest and most of which are, uh, are fairly scarce, some of which are indeed very, very rare. For example, here in this uh, case, I have uh, some personal items. These are the deck of cards that the FDR uh, would play solitaire with. Uh, these were given to me by uh, Mrs. Roosevelt. I was her guest on several occasions in, uh, in Hyde Park. Uh, this is a plate from, the, uh, from Hyde Park, from the family, showing the family crest uh, on it, which is the... Uh, uh, Key Plantapit Kirabit, one of the uh, uh, ancient Roosevelt family crests. This, uh, this, this wine glass comes from the White House with the uh, presidential uh, seal uh, in it. The, uh, this uh, hollowed out book comes from FDR's desk and it contains, as you see, some of his uh, matchbooks with his uh, motto on them. And uh, here are two uh, of his uh, personal cigarette holders. Bill Winslow is a sales engineer. He used to admire his grandfather's antique car, one day he bought an old Model A, and now he collects old cars, accessories, gas pumps, licenses, and miscellaneous items. This item here is a three pound Thomas J. Webb coffee can, and it still has the coffee in it. This is from somewhere in the 20s. This item over here is an old iron and this is the days before electricity when they would take and put their coals in the iron and use this for ironing the iron would become hot and when the coals cooled down they would add more coals to it this item that i have here is quite rare this is an item that the days before electricity and electrical refrigerators they used this when they got their ice, and it was block ice, and they would fill this with hot water right here, and then set this on top of the block of ice. The heat of the water would heat the metal, and it would drop down, forming ice cubes, and they would then chip these off with an ice pick and have ice cubes. This item over here is an old beer bottle from about 1900. 
This is when they had the porcelain caps on the bottles, and the cap never left the bottle. The consumer would get it, open it, drink his beer, and return the bottle with the cap intact. This is a horn from the era of 1905 to 1910. It is a French horn that was imported into the United States, and it has three trumpets and plays a tune. Boda runs a tavern in Chicago Heights, which he has filled with his collection of Nickelodeons, player pianos, jukeboxes, anything mechanical that makes noise. music boxes, hurdy-gurdies, and uh, uh, anything musical. And now I'm, the only thing I could find now is the player pianos that they had years ago, and I'm picking them up. And uh, then I have all, a lot of other collectors collecting items. I have an old blacksmith shop, an old ice cream powder, very first type ice cream powder, and I have the equipment for it. And, and, uh, then I have part of a wagon works in my warehouses. I have quite a few warehouses full of stuff. more demanding or personal than the services of a modern trust department. And no bank knows that better than American National Bank and Trust Company. Gordon Campbell, who administers our multi-billion dollar trust department, makes sure that both individual and corporate trust problems are managed thoughtfully and thoroughly by our 250 highly trained people. Whether it's Bill Dillon handling a living trust for an individual to help solve estate and investment problems, or the multitude of services and investment counseling needed by corporations, unions, or foundations, the real difference in banks shows up in the dedication of the people you deal with. The only kind of people you'll find in our trust department are enthusiastic people with ideas to help you. American National. The Idea Bank, where people make the difference. Good evening, friends. This is your host to welcome you through the creaking door into the inner sanctum. Would you recommend collecting as a way to help a person cope? Absolutely. Collecting as a method of coping is far superior to many kinds of methods like becoming psychotic or becoming depressed or becoming a criminal or being unable to function. These are far more serious ways of coping. Collecting uh, can have a lot of fun attached to it, can have an economic aspect of it. I would certainly recommend collecting, short of going to a psychiatrist. Why do you collect? There's a lot of fun with it. 
It makes, uh, I think, uh, makes me unique because everybody doesn't have it. And it's very hard to be unique these days because there's so much sameness in the world today. And uh, I think it, it shows history of our country because you look back, it shows Casey Jones, the popular uh, railroad conductor, recommends this. It showed a different way of life then. Uh, and uh, you go back and look at the testimonials. Uh, Mrs. Adley E. Stevenson says, send me a bottle right away. That's from 1900. The then wife of the vice president. Buffalo Bill says, I use this product all the time. Send me one. And so it has some history to it. There's a lot of pathos. There's sadness. Here's a bottle that in 1800 something sold for $3. And you know what people earn a week in those? Is, I don't know, $15 a week or something. So there's a lot of sadness that they, doctors couldn't do the job then. They didn't have the know-how. And people were looking for... The medicine man. Well, you just don't know where to stop. Uh, there are some collectors uh, of radio programs who say they want to get every uh, shadow program that was ever produced, and that's it. They are uh, shadow freaks. Uh, they're Jack Benny nuts. They are uh, Burns and Allen weirdos. But uh, you just, it's, it's like potato chips. You know, you can't stop eating them. I think Roosevelt himself uh, said it best. When he, uh, in one of his uh, essays, said the following, He who gathers together not the rumors, the gossip concerning a great man, but the actual things that, that, that the man wrote and said with an account of what he did has performed a valuable service. Well, I'm a collector because it's my hobby, and I think that the items that I collect represent early America or things of the past that were either before my life or part of them during my life that I remember. The elderly people, they like the stuff way back in, say, 1910 and uh, 20s, see. And the people of today, they're not too old, and they like the stuff in 40s. So you have to collect every little everything. Now I'm, now I'm collecting televisions. Now who'd think of collecting a television? Well, a lot of people remember, oh, I had my television in 1948. Well, oh, then they'll see it, they'll have it on display and say, well, I had one like that. Well, then, there you go. Where do these things come from? Who has them? Who saves them? And there are nuts like myself about uh, on radio uh, who collect these things. And uh, we trade. We send the list back and forth. I send the list of the shows that I have, and they send me a list of the programs in their collection. And uh, we'll trade a shadow, for example, for a Lone Ranger or for whatever we're looking for. Uh, we get programs from... Uh, uh, I collect with people from all over the country, and uh, Puerto Rico, and Canada, and uh, Pago Pago. I had a collector there, and in England they're very big, and we're getting a lot of the English radio programs. And you know, radio is still uh, very much alive in uh, South Africa. As a, uh, as a labor lawyer representing a great many different unions, I have an opportunity to do much traveling. And i have uh, traveling from one end of the country to the other on various professional assignments. And I've always made it my business to uh, uh, stop in some of the antique shops, some of the junk shops. Uh, and I'm on the mailing list of uh, all, all kinds of uh, places of that kind. And in addition to that, there are catalogs, there are auctions. Uh, and uh, those are sources from which some of this stuff has come. So I start going to old saloons and looking for the old Nickelodeons. And I talk to the beer men. Soda pop men, and all different cigarette salesmen, and every, all the salesmen that go in different places of business, like restaurants, taverns, and so forth, and that's the way I found a lot of them. What's the most exciting find that you made? Oh, the most exciting find that I got was uh, one that I found in Rockford. It's a big machine, and, and it has uh, 12 different instruments in it. Why was that exciting? What was special about that? Well, it's a very rare machine for the collectors, and, uh, and it sounds very, very good compared to modern machines. Something like 10 years worth of Fibber McGee and Molly broadcasts. Uh, you know, they were on from Chicago initially, and then they went out to California, and they were sponsored by Johnson's Wax, and Harlow Wilcox was the announcer on the show, and Wallace Wimple, and all of those characters were there, and we have uh, all of these ta all of these tapes uh, which they were which have been made from the large transcription discs what is so rare as a day in spring in wistful vista with mrs mcgee sitting reading on the porch her husband picking weeds out of the lawn and his on and off pal gildersleeve 
fixing window screens next door. We can't think of anything. But that's how it is today with Fibber McGee and Molly. Hey, Molly, I got an ocean to go fishing. I just found a worm. <laughs> well, keep scratching around here. Maybe you'll find a horseshoe and we can go horseback riding. I suppose the, the rare piece is, uh, is, is this one. This is the Warren Wheelock head of FDR. Uh, this is the original head. This is the original sculpture. Warren Wheelock is a, <clears throat> a very famous sculptor, and uh, this was never reproduced. And is, and is recognized as probably one of the best representatives, certainly one of the most characteristic poses of FDR. I'm very proud of this, uh, of this possession, and I regard this head as probably a, a cornerstone in, in, the, uh, in the collection. I have a great many items that are interesting and unusual, and it would be a little hard to pick one particular item. Uh, I would guess I would have to pick one of my cars. Well, I'm currently restoring a 1930 Packard Super 8 Rumble Seat Coupe. This car was acquired about two years ago from a farmer out in Hebron, Illinois, and it came out of his barn where it had been resting since the early 40s. He bought the car secondhand and used it on his farm to tow around his hay wagon and tow his vegetable wagon out to the street to sell his roadside vegetables. Uh, here are some other things. Uh, Kickapoo Indian Sagua. And this goes back to the turn of the century, and it's practically good for everything. Jaundice, bilious attacks, all diseases of the stomach, liver, kidneys, and blood, which is fantastic. We don't need a cancer cure because we got it right here. What's the alcoholic content? Well, the al alcoholic content on most of these things are anywhere from 10% up to 75% alcoholic content. Probably and, could cure just about it. <laughs> you know, 100 proof liquor is 50% alcohol. Some of these are 50, 60, 70% alcohol. Now, here's Padre's wine elixir during Prohibition. You just had to put a Padre's picture on there, or the old Abbey or something, and uh, you sold it as a tonic, elixir and tonic, but it really was wine. Most real dyed in the wool collectors look down their noses at the economic motive. However, in addition to whatever valid reasons, the true collector has many irrational reasons of which he has no knowledge at all. He will give himself all kinds of explanations, and if you ask him why he collects, he, he will believe what he says. What he says usually is a rationalization, because he isn't aware of these inner compulsive reasons uh, that underlies collecting. When you get a collector who specializes in these items of the past, old automobiles or uh, everything that was printed before 1720, if they printed anything then, then sometimes you will see the same fear of death, fear of growing old, fear of what may happen, which he tries to handle by focusing all of his attention backwards. What's the explanation for people who collect items about a well-known person? He identifies with the person who, about whom he is collecting things. And so, although he doesn't consciously say so, and he may have all kinds of rationalizations to explain his, his collecting, in the back of his mind, he is sort of saying, I am like my hero. That makes me more important than I feel I really am. Dr. Littner, do you collect anything? No, I really don't. Oh, no. For evil lurks in the hearts of men. This is the area at American National Bank and Trust Company where businessmen meet with us to exchange ideas. Our people are uniquely different. Like Joe Gaffigan, who takes a personal interest in a company's business. All of our officers get deeply involved because they know that's the best way they can serve customers and be able to match them idea for idea in solving business problems. You know, there really aren't many differences in the services major banks can provide their customers. The only real difference in banks is people. People like Joe who's truly dedicated to finding ways to help every customer. That's what motivates all of us at American National, the Idea Bank, 
where people like Joe Gaffigan make the difference. Come in, come in. I've been reading my fan mail. Huh? Did somebody say the lady spook out of turn? <laughs> Are you obsessed with this collection? I think I sleep about six hours, and the rest of the time I'm working on my collection of old-time radio tapes. Seriously, I spend about eight hours at the newspaper office putting out a newspaper, and the rest of the time is spent with the collection uh, and with the radio broadcast. In the gathering of it, yes, wherever I am, if I'm passing a, an old drugstore, or where I know it was an old drugstore, or if I'm um, an antique store, I, I always want to stop and look to see if I can find something like this to tie in with the collection. And people now are bringing me things, too, because I know I'm interested. I'm somewhat obsessed, yeah.